Ah, merci. Um, so, legal, uh, we've talked about liability, we've talked about corporation. I'm going to talk to you about trademarking. Trademarking, for me, is, has become so important that we've made it a tenant, we've made it a uh, mainstay in my firm by acquiring and partnering with a trademark agent who's been in the game for a decade, over a decade. We've got this person in my firm because every person I was incorporating, every Every, every hackathon, every person that was converting or starting to brand had questions about trademarking. And they had misconceptions that were so bad and, 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 and ill-conceived that I felt compelled to start educating people about the importance of trademarking. And this is exactly what we've done. So what is, what is trademarking? Trademarking is brand insurance. That's all it is. Okay, it's brand insurance. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that you understand why it's brand insurance. So entrepreneurs, business people come to see me. They ask me the same questions over and over again. They make the same mistakes. And I've seen catastrophic scenarios and ones that have been prevented because of the brand insurance. So first of all, what's trademarking? Trademarking is a federal jurisdiction. <clears throat> from coast to coast, there is something called the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, also known as CIPO, which governs a gigantic database where people dump all of their trademarks, their word marks, their slogans, their designs. They manage all of this. This is not patenting. Patenting is a different game subject to a different set of rules. I'm talking to you about cold, hard slogans. So legal logic. Uh, it could be, you know, big or small, we sue them all. That could be my trademark. <laughs> it's not, but it could be. It could be uh, whatever. You get the point. But anything that, anything that encompasses your logo, the way that you look, the way that you present yourself to the public should be protected because you, you, do, you, you don't want people copying you naturally. So people come to my office and they say, how do I do this? How much does it cost? Where do I go? Before going further, we've tried to do something to give people reflexes. We've tried to give people a preliminary search. So when people come in and say, can I search it on my own? And I want to do it anyways because I know that I can just file the application myself. Yes, go to SIPO, pay the fee, get it done the same way you can incorporate yourself. Not a problem. You don't even need to call my office. What happens is that you are not, okay, unless you're trained to do so, you cannot do an exhaustive search, you cannot properly, and it's not feasible for you to look at all the databases available in order to make sure that nothing similar exists that can come back to bite you in the ass later. So yes, you go to SIPO, you put in Acme Design. No hits, great, you get excited. You go to Google, Acme Design. Great, there's nobody on the first page. You go to Bing. Actually, you probably don't go to Bing. <laughs> but but you, go to these, you go to these platforms to say, you know, the domain doesn't exist, SIPO doesn't exist, I'm going to go ahead and do it. It's a problem because unless someone is certified to do a comprehensive test, and this is in the back, this is in the gray area. This is where you don't see the obvious hits. Unless someone can go and do those back-end search in the, in the abyss, to pull out things that are lingering, it could be a problem for you. So what you, what, you, what you should be doing is having an exhaustive trademark search on a preliminary basis to make sure that there is nothing, not only exactly identical, but that could be confusingly similar. So is there an Acme design with two ends or an Acme design with an accent aigu at the end? If you don't see these and you go ahead and register and base your branding on all of this, it could, be, it could be a bad news, and, I'll, and I'll get, I'm going to give you guys a clear, concrete example of this. People always also, also ask me, if I use it first, Jamie, is it mine? Not necessarily. The old adage, uh, you know, use it or lose it, definitely uh, applies. So, yes, it's important to have first use, but it's also important to document the first use. I'll give you another concrete example. I represent a company that does embroidering on plush toys. 
It shot up on popularity, tens of thousands of Facebook lights, does all kinds of business. She's catering to the moms and the kids. And on the belly of this plush animal, she's putting in the, the, uh, you know, the, the, all the stats of a newborn, the weight, the sex, the name, all that stuff. Somebody started coming on, started saying, oh my God, this woman is gaining in popularity. Copied the design, started doing the same thing on plush toys. She calls me, she goes, this girl is causing me problems. She's diverting all my traffic. I'm losing business, what do I do? We didn't, even, we, didn't, we didn't even file a design mark at that point. We were on the verge of doing so. It doesn't matter. She has common law first right use to this design. So in that specific case, she came to see me. We sued the imposter. But it was not easy. Why? Because I couldn't go to SIPO and pull out my registration number and say, Oh, look, Mr. and Madame Tunmont, everybody in Canada, on March 21st, 2014, I've already filed my design. I notified the world that I do business and I, and I do marking with this belly design. Doesn't mean I can't sue. What it means is that I have to work harder and I have to try harder to show a judge that I've got rights and use. So what do I do? I gotta ask her to go back and find me her old, uh, uh, her, her old PO, purchase orders from, from, from whatever. I gotta go back, she's gotta pull out her designs. She's gotta dust them off. She's gotta create a paper trail showing that since 2014, she's been using this design. Long story short, we went to the judge, we had a very good case, and we got an injunction to seize the imposter to stop using this. Regardless, we've still filed our, our, our trademark, we benefit from a trademark, and we've also enforced our rights, our common law rights. So the interplay of the registration on trademarking, brand insurance, and the use go hand in hand. Extremely important, I need to protect both, and the paper trail needs to be there. People also ask me if I register or incorporate my business, is it, excuse me, isn't the name mine? Yes, it is yours. You have common law rights over that name. It doesn't mean you have a trademark. It doesn't mean that you have any significant brand insurance. So I'll give you my example, Legal Logic Inc. I've used that as my legal name. That is my legal name in Quebec. I've registered with the Quebec Business Registrar. It's registered federally with, the, with, the Canadian, with, the corp with Corporations Canada. But nobody in Vancouver gives a shit about legal logic. Nobody in Shabugamu of whatever the hell in somewhere else doesn't care about it unless it's not gonna be on their radar unless it's registered with the CIPO, Canadian Intellectual Property Office, which it is. So my logo and my name are protected nationally. If somebody starts operating a legal logic in Calgary, I will hunt them down and kill, I won't kill them, but I will hunt them down and make sure that it's removed from their name. So it's not the same thing. Just because you incorporate and do business in Quebec doesn't mean you have a trademark protected nationally. People also ask me by the same vein if I've registered the, dona the domain, isn't it mine? No. Doesn't work that way either. SIPO does not use the domain to base themselves on to say, yes, this person's protected. So LegalLogic.com does not give me any any more protection than Legal Logic Inc. So we need to dispel those four, those four questions. They need to be answered and you need to understand. So it's important to get a preliminary search done of your name, slogan, word mark, design. So who's this guy? This guy is a guy from British Columbia. Dave, I think he's from Kelowna, Kelowna BC. He's from Kelowna and what's his name again, Dave? Mike Urban. So Mike Urban was an engineer by trade. And he was traveling to Europe, I believe. And he fell on a distillery. And um, he said, you know, I don't, I don't want to be an engineer anymore. I, I want to open a distillery. He told himself, well, a distillery uh, is kind of like an engineering facility, so I'll do that. And I'll brand it. And I'll go out and I'm going to sell liquor to the world. And it's going to be great. I'll have a good time. 
followed his passion just like most of you guys. So Mr. Urban goes back home to Kelowna, builds his distilleries, <clears throat> took him a long time on money, invested his life savings in it. <coughs> Mr. Urban also branded his, his corporation as Spirit Bear Distillery. I think that's right, Dave. The company's Urban Distillery, the product was Spirit Bear. Spirit Bear. Spirit Bear Vodka. Spirit Bear Vodka and, and, and Spirits. So he, he dumps his entire life savings into this branding. SEO, cards, shows, trade shows, da 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 So he goes along on this path and gets an amazing momentum. People are drinking his vodka and his spirits, not only in home, but he's doing great. He's getting recognized on the scene. And he gets the wind cut out of his sail. And he basically gets um, kicked in the nuts, so to speak, because somebody sends him a cease and desist. Somebody sends him a cease and desist from a uh, First Nation um, area and says, sorry, Mr. Urban, but you have to stop using this brand because it belongs to us. We're the ones who've been using it. We're the ones who have been uh, trying to develop it. So stop using it. Otherwise, we're going to sue you. After having a couple of his own vodkas, he goes back to the table and he says, no, we're going to fight this. And his lawyers say, let's do this. You know, we've done everything properly. So it ends up in court. And the court rules in his favor. The court rules that Spirit Bear, the, the First Nation brand, was different on, on, on other levels, and that the marks and the slogans and the way that Mr. Urban protected his intellectual property differentiated itself enough, and the way that it was protected allowed him to continue using it and brand under that name. So the case against him was dropped. So the reason why I'm giving you this example is, yes, it's a success story, and it's very nice to have this protection. But imagine if it did not work out for Mr. Urban and Spirit Bear. Imagine years of life savings and branding and everything that went into making this a viable brand. Imagine starting at zero. Imagine Spirit Bear became Spirit Serpent or Spirit Worm. You could imagine that that could set you at zero. And this is why people underestimate the protection of trademarking. <clears throat>